Well, Acts chapter 17 again, please. Let's hear the word of God. We're going to read the same passage before we get into it again this morning. Acts chapter 17. Let's hear God's word. Verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship, without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysus, the Areopagite, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Our gracious God, thank you again for the opportunity we have to read and to hear your word proclaimed. Come and meet with us. Change our thinking, change our minds, change, Lord, our lives in the sense that your word would conform and shape and mold us even into your image. Grant it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've noticed from verse 16 that the apostle Paul is in Athens, a beautiful city loaded with curious ideas and activities, and some of them very explicitly immoral, and some of them very interesting, some very educational, But from what we saw, Paul's comprehension of the scene was that he looked on the city with spiritual eyes. What do we mean by that? Just simply that he was able to look beyond the outward appearance, 
that which first would appeal to one's senses, and he considered that behind all of this, there was a city that was desperately lost, desperately confused, and that really needed the gospel. Indeed, we also considered his emotional state as he looked at this scene. He didn't flee from it, as we're going to see today, but he took steps to seek to spread the gospel. He pondered, considered, how can I present Christ to these people? And we're going to see that today just how that unfolded and how Paul chose on this occasion to seek to introduce the good news of the gospel to this uh, desperately needy society. So we've noted what Paul saw. We've thought of how Paul felt. Uh, and we even considered what motivated them. Now, last night we primarily touched on the motivation being the glory of God. It would be fair to say that there are other motivations, there are other reasons for us to look at the world around us and say, we have a duty to take the gospel to these people. One would, of course, be to obey our God who has given us the Great Commission. Indeed, Paul is in Athens in the first place in response to a vision that he had in the night when he had been called to Macedonia. I know that you're familiar with the account, with the story of how the Apostle Paul uh, wondered, well, where should I be going? And he tried one way and it was, the door was shut, the door was blocked and he had a vision and there was a man saying, come over and help us. And he obeyed that vision. He took the lead and he went from uh, there to Philippi and then to Thessalonica and then to Berea and from Berea uh, down into Athens itself. He has been fulfilling the Great Commission. What does that mean? He's been living uh, an obedient Christian life. He's been doing what the Lord Jesus Christ instructed all of his disciples to do, to go into the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's why Paul's there. He's motivated by obedience. And then we did see last night as we looked at it that, yes, another motivation is indeed a compassion for souls. This is certainly what Paul is experiencing. I think we saw that last night. He is not only seeking to be obedient to a command, but there's a heartfelt response to that command. There's a tenderness, there's a compassion. But we also consider the third and the great motive for evangelism, uh, for seeking to take the gospel to the world, and that is uh, a passion for, for the glory of God, a desire uh, to honor God and to see God um, accepted and respected and loved and obeyed as he deserves. And the apostle had a love for the honor of King Jesus. He knew that God had given uh, him a name which is, was above every name and that he was worthy to be bowed to and worthy to be confessed to be Lord and God. And the fact that these people uh, were behaving as they were with their idolatry, it grieved him. So there are various reasons why we would want to go out into the world and preach the gospel. Indeed, the Apostle Paul uh, reminds us here of Henry Martin, a 19th century missionary. I think I did mention him last night. I quoted uh, one statement that he said where he said, I could not endure existence if Jesus was not glorified to me. It would be hell to me if he was always to be dishonored. The context of Henry Martin is that he, he was truly and, and, and genuinely motivated with the thought that if Jesus is not honored, then it's the greatest injustice. It's the greatest wrong. Yes, I can be wronged. Yes, my people group can be wronged. But if Jesus is wronged, something needs to be done about it. He was an activist but for the cause of Christ. He wasn't a social justice activist. He was a Christ Jesus activist. And he was motivated to do great things for God. We'll mention more of them later on as well. But we're going to continue on in this passage and see what lessons we can draw and apply as we go along 
relating to our desire to take the gospel to a post-Christian world. And the first thing that we should notice is the, the, the manner in which Paul conducted himself. Here he is, enthused, motivated, desiring to be used. Now, how did he do it? What was the style? What was the manner in which he moved into this situation and began to communicate with these people who had no idea what he was about, who had no clue what message he was about to bring to them? They never looked at him and said, well, that's the Apostle Paul. He's going to give us a good gospel sermon. They had no clue. He's a, he's a new face. He's a fresh face. He's maybe a strange little face from what we can gather. But the reality is, he moves into this situation with wisdom and, and, and yet with courage. And I hope that we can see that as we develop this. The style, the manner in which he approached. Paul, being very aware of their blindness, motivated with this great desire to see God glorified, if he did nothing at this point, we would all be left kind of with the uh, 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 feeling. You know that? It'd be like, here he is in Athens. We're, we're anticipating something. And he's moved. And he's longing for a change. And he says, well, I'll go and sit in Starbucks and just have a wee latte to myself. And I'll just enjoy it. We're expecting something, aren't we? We're expecting something to happen. There has to be action. Now, we don't know if he had tears in his eyes. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But the proof that his burden was real, the proof that verse uh, seven, 16 is not just hot air, is that we read in verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. There was reality, and we see the reality because of the action. As was his habit, verse 17 tells us, he went to the Jews who already had the scriptures. And he hoped that he was able in this lost city to initially approach the people that said they believed the Bible. And he went to them with a desire to show them the, 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 the revelation in the Old Testament of the one whom he came to preach, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we find that he didn't just stay in the synagogue where the Jews, the, the, the immigrants from Israel were hanging out. He went to the Gentiles in the marketplace. He went there into the marketplace where there were just rank heathen and pagans and those who had no idea of the name of the Lord. Now, interesting, when I was raised with the King James Bible, and maybe some of you use that, and I can respect that. I use the new King James. Maybe some have been wondering that. But in the, in the King James Bible, it says that he went to the marketplace and disputed now, as a young guy, when I got saved, uh, if you think I'm arrogant now, I was more arrogant back then, right? Uh, the, 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 I was just a young guy, and I, I, I believed the gospel, and what am I going to do? I'm going to go and I'm going to dispute, because that's what the Bible says. Paul went and he disputed. So go and have good arguments with people left, right, and center. Is that not what evangelism is? Is that not what this post-Christian world needs people that can put them in their place and tell them what they need to hear. The only trouble is that's really not what the Apostle Paul did. And it's, in that case, not a good translation. And we'll, we'll get into that a wee bit more. But it is important that we realize that this post-modern world doesn't need disputers. It needs those like Paul that are going out to present the gospel of Christ. I, I recall a man that 
went that I, when I was in construction, uh, I got a job for a season that was fitting kitchens. Uh, so we would, I was a carpenter, I would take the kitchen, uh, and then there was a plumber with me. And as we pulled up plumber carpenter to this guy's door, the plumber looked at the house and he looked at me and he laughed and he said, oh, this guy's one of yours. And I said, what do you mean? And he just laughed. He said, you'll see. And we went into the man's house. Now I knew what he meant. He meant this guy's a Christian. That's what he meant. Uh, and we went into the house and pretty soon I discovered how this man operated. He would come into the kitchen. You know, some people hover over you when you're working in their home. Don't do that. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> but he would come into the kitchen every 10 minutes with a new topic, a new news item, a new moral issue, and he would want the plumber's opinion, knowing that the plumber would give him the wrong answer, and then he would tear into him, and he would argue with him, and the plumber, of course, was all ready for it. He was just having fun. I don't know if the man thought he was really having a great effect for the gospel, but the fact is the plumber was just uh, what we would say nowadays, trolling him to be honest. And of course, when this man found out that I was a Christian, uh, he gave me a break at first because the news items and the moral issues, he assumed I would be in agreement with him. But then we were back the next day and he'd obviously lay in his bed and thought of topics. And he got up the next day and he comes into the kitchen again and again with doctrinal issues. The second coming. Does every Christian have an angel appointed to him? Who were the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6? Could what, happened in, could what have happened in Leviticus 10 when uh, Nadab and Abihu were burned with fire because of disobedience happen today? You get the idea. And of course, no matter what I said, I was wrong. And my plumber friend was just having a great laugh. He just enjoyed it. It was entertainment for him. And I should say that this nice Christian man put in a complaint about our work about a month later. Uh, so it, it was a character. But he, I think, genuinely thought that that's what evangelism is, especially the first day when it was more directed towards the plumber. He thought that this is how you reach people. You show them how wrong they are about everything. You beat them down and you, you dissuade them from thinking and having opinions that are different even to yours. When street evangelists begin to count up how many good arguments that they've managed to provoke instead of how many people they've had a good opportunity to present Christ to, there's something wrong. Street evangelists that scoff, that deride, that even for YouTube hits, film those scoffing sessions and those derisions and those beating down of people so that they can put them on YouTube and have hits and, and be considered a mighty evangelist, they're completely off the charts. I guarantee if the Apostle Paul had a GoPro strapped around his chest, he would have turned it off more often than turned it on because he was seeking to meet people rather than just get situations to have hits and to make himself look good. He was seeking right there in the moment to have an impact for the gospel rather than have a reputation for being somebody that's out there telling the world what he really thinks of them. Now, do I stand condemned for saying this, for presenting this man in Scotland, the, the man that we fitted the kitchen for, as being off base? These YouTube evangelists that go out and win arguments and get people dumbfounded and then post it under the title something like, uh, atheist has no clue what to say, you know, 3,400,000 hits, you know. A am I wrong? Because the Apostle Paul went and the King James says, disputing. Well, the reality is the word that's used here 
isn't to dispute. It's to reason with. Dialogomai. Does that sound like an English word? Dialogue. Dialogue. He went out and dialogued. And the context here is clearly of Paul ministering the word of God in a way that the people to whom he was speaking were being drawn in. And there was a, there was a two-way communication to some degree. And in fact, it's even used to describe Paul's preaching style when he was in Troas in Acts chapter 20. Remember the incident where the young guy falls out the window and, and the apostle Paul is given the grace to see that young man raised to life again. Well, the reality is in that context, it's this word that's used indicating that Paul is reasoning. It's not that he was necessarily having a Q&A session. Maybe he was. Maybe a little bit of back and forward because the word definitely indicates to have a dialogue, to, to, to have a sense in which there's, there's a two-way street to some degree, maybe to more degree in one case than in another. But the reality is it wasn't that Paul was out there trying to beat people up with his great arguments. I remember being in the market in Riverside in California a few years ago with a little table and next to us was the local mosque with their table. And one young guy came up to us and he said, Islam is right, Christianity is wrong. He was, I think, straight out of Morocco. And I looked at him and I said, well, actually let's talk about that then. And he just raised his voice and shouted, Islam is right, Christianity is wrong. And his buddies started looking a wee bit kind of awkward because they realized that they had a loose cannon. And I, again, I thought, okay, well, let's try and talk about that then. You know, of course, people are now starting to stop and have a wee look as he shouted for the third time. Now louder, really loud, Islam is right, Christianity is wrong. And after a few attempts, I honestly just laughed because this wasn't going to be dialogamai. This was going to be the dispute that Paul didn't engage in. And his buddies come up and sort of carried them off and cooled them down. Uh, and we escaped, you know, a scene. And the point is that Paul went into the marketplace not to create a scene. And we're living in an age when much of public evangelism is a scene. I was in Nampa, Idaho. My three granddaughters were with me. I was in a market just a, a year or so ago, a couple of years ago maybe now. And I was taking them up to a little stall to buy them something. And I hear an open air preacher. And I bought them their candy. I saw a wall. I said, come on, we'll go over here girls and sit down and listen to the man while we eat our candy. And as we sit down, the guy starts shouting at people walking by, using language that I just automatically, when he said what he said, and I'm not going to say it from the pulpit, I, I went, hey, because it was my grandkids were there. And this is the preacher. And, and the people that were passing thought that I was hiding at them. And they said, well, he said that. And I said, no, I heard them. And then he stops and he turns on me and he comes up to me and we ended up getting into a little bit of a dispute in that because I'm saying to him, listen to the language you're using. I've got my grandkids here and you're supposed to be preaching the gospel. This is a joke. You're, you're supposed to be telling these, well, these people, they're, they're, they're homosexuals and they're this and that. And the people are looking back like, are we? You know, they were just out for the market, you know. It was bizarre. Now, I'll be honest, and some of you younger guys especially might find it, but I've been on a few times over the last couple of years typing in Nampa street preacher, you know, meets Scotsman to see if he's put it on. He hasn't, as far as I can see, because he had his buddy standing with a video camera. It was all about that. That is not what Paul did. There was a time maybe in the United States when an open-air preacher, for example, 
it would almost be expected of him that he would be chiding the community and telling the community how bad they were and how wrong they were. And to some degree, in some places in the US, certainly in Scotland, it was true in the 1950s, and up until maybe 20 years ago in Northern Ireland, it would almost be expected that the open-air preacher would be up there chiding people and telling them just how stupid they were and, and, and how s- sinful and wicked they were and, and, and uh, how, how wrong they were about everything, even secondary issues. I'm not talking about just sin issues, just secondary issues. Those days are gone. Paul went into a situation where the people, they had no respect. There wasn't a built-in respect for the gospel. It wasn't that there was already this understanding of, oh yeah, we know what you and your culture and your religion has done for our nation for centuries. There was none of that, and there's none of that today, folks. None of that. So we can learn from this. What did Paul do? How did he approach it? Would it be by him showing he was smarter than them that he would win them over? Absolutely not. He had a genuine concern for the souls of these people. And it would have been a contradiction for him to act in any other way than how he did act, which was to sensibly, yet unapologetically, without embarrassment, but sensibly and even diplomatically, and we're going to see this develop very clearly, very diplomatically, cleverly, but honestly present the claims of Jesus Christ to this community. Notice Paul is said to have discussed the things of God in the synagogue and with the Jews. He went to where there were obviously people who had a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of common grace, maybe some whose hearts were opening. But the reality is, he he also went out into the world where it was raw, raw. And our temptation is to like the kind of people we call in grace, but the people that are raw are as precious and as valuable as those in the synagogue, so to speak. And Paul shows us what it looks like to go in amongst that. So a little bit about his manner then, right? That was his manner, the style in which he went. Not a raving madman, but a thoughtful, clever evangelist. What about the the content? So what did he say? What was his focus? Notice at the end of verse 18, he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. That's the summary of it. We don't have his every word. Even later on when he goes up to the Areopagus, we don't have his every word, but there's a lot more. And, And so remember this, guys, there are two scenes here. One is in the synagogues and in the marketplace, and this is happening for several days. And then eventually, there's another scene, and we're not there yet. We're not at Mars Hill yet. We're still in the marketplace. We're still these first several days. However many days they were, we don't really know. But let's just say a few days, he's hanging about the synagogue, he's out into the marketplace. Hanging about the synagogue, out into the marketplace. What, what, what's the summary of what Paul was talking about? Jesus and the resurrection. This is the gist of his content. Now, it doesn't mean he didn't speak about anything else. It doesn't mean that every time he went out and spoke to people, he started at the virgin birth talked about the life of Jesus Christ and then his death and his resurrection and that was the package and nothing else. It doesn't mean that, but the main point, the main point, the thrust, the essence of what his discussions were with people, his dialogue was all about was the person and work and victory of Jesus. Indeed, 
We know that when he goes to Mars Hill, he delves into some deeper, uh, some uh, more uh, contextualizing topics that set Jesus up. And he may have done that here. But Jesus and the resurrection. If we all got five minutes, if you're guaranteed today five minutes with someone or a group of people in this post-Christian world, what would we want to leave them with? Well, here's the clue. Jesus and his victory. That's the heart of it. We tend to maybe think, well, I need to show them how evil everything is and how wrong the agenda is. And even at the table at breakfast, I mentioned Davos. We need to tell them about Davos and just the agenda that's going on, the darkness of it all. But what they need is Jesus, the narrative, the story, and his victory. I read a book, a book uh, that a Muslim, ex-Muslim guy wrote uh, who was from Saudi Arabia. And the book's called From Mecca to Christ. It was fascinating, enjoyed it. And what was significant was it wasn't the arguments showing the Koran to promote murder, the murder of the infidel that caused them eventually to say, wait a wee minute, what am I doing? Nor was it the fact that Muhammad married a six-year-old girl and consummated the marriage when she was but nine. It wasn't that that persuaded him to turn away from Islam. It was rather seeing the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding his grace and his love. It was grasping the fact that rather than look for revenge on those who were killing him, he cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. It was the story, the person, the work of Jesus Christ. He knew about the child bride. He knew about the infidel and how they must be murdered. But it was when he saw Jesus that he was able to see that there's life and there's hope. But we could think, no, we need to show the evil of the system, the inconsistencies. Show the young liberal the horror of human trafficking and what their no borders policy uh, invites. Show them that. They're bound to be, be horrified by it. Tell them all about the, the, the reality of um, j just how children are are groomed if they have this LGBTQ T blah, 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 uh, agenda. Tell, tell them how it's going to damage the children and wound the children. Not that we don't talk about these things, of course. In fact, sometimes I talk about these things too much. But I know, Lord, help me to practice what I know. It's the story of Jesus that changes lives. I remember as a young guy, we had a family friend. His name was Franco Maggiotto. You can look his name up online. There's web pages about him. He was a Roman Catholic priest in Italy. And he uh, was literally engaged in the mass. He was doing the mass. It's a Martin Luther-like story. There was a young kid reading from Hebrews chapter 10 as Franco was holding up the wafer. And he starts to hear about Jesus dying once and for all and his sacrifice being perfect and he put the wafer down and he said you know the Bible says that Jesus has done what needs to be done we don't need to keep re-sacrificing his story is a great story he became a family friend he was from the north of Italy and I I as again this young teenager guy who got saved who believed that disputing was the way that you evangelize I love the chick magazines. Do you remember them? You older guys maybe do chick publications. Yep, some heads nodding. And there was one, there was more than one, but there was 
a few done by this guy or about this guy called Alberto Riviera, a Jesuit priest who got saved. And the magazines were him exposing the kind of underbelly, the political movement of the Jesuits and how they actually infiltrate governments and infiltrate churches. You know, and I remember thinking, this is what everybody needs to hear. You know, and I genuinely thought evangelism was telling people, well, do you realize that the Jesuits do this? And the, the real Pope is the Black Pope, not the Pope in Rome. It's the Jesuit leader. That's what he's called, the Black Pope. Uh, and I thought that's what people needed to know. And I said to Franco, yeah, you know, Franco, I've been reading about Alberto Rivera. And, you know, and, uh, really helpful stuff, isn't it? Real important. And he was just a wee short man. And he says, Robert with his Italian accent, he says, people need to hear about Jesus. You can go with all the, all the scandals of Rome or all the, the negative realities of Islam or all the utter mental craziness of modern liberalism. You can go with stories and say, look what it does, look what it does, look at the damage, look how horrible it is. And he says, an unregenerate person is going to look at the church and say, oh yeah, and your pastors, we've heard stories about them too. And they're going to match you one for one. And, and, the, and the, the result will be a draw. Everybody's equal. You're all the same. He says the one thing we have is the story of the power of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that wasn't, to be honest, what I wanted them to say. So I didn't totally take his advice at that point, but I look back and say, thank you, Lord, for bringing wee Franco into my life. It's interesting that Paul didn't go into the marketplace and at the beginning start tearing down. Even when he went to the Areopagus, we're going to see he didn't even there start tearing down their philosophies and their ideas and mocking them and deriding them. He didn't tolerate them. We'll talk about that maybe later tomorrow as well. But the, the point is, he chose right away to sum it all up to talk about Jesus and the resurrection, to talk about his power over sin, his power over death, his, his glorious victory over the destruction that sin has brought. Jesus and the resurrection. Now some would say, well, this isn't the only passage in the Bible on evangelism. But it is actually one of the definitive passages. And you're right, it's not the only passage on evangelism and on, on what we emphasize. It's not, you're right, I accept that. For example, there's Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. There's another definitive passage, and it happens to be saying the same thing. It happens to be what Paul was doing. We're told in the book of Romans that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We're told in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that the promise of the power of God would be to help the disciples to be witnesses of the resurrection when the Spirit comes. He'll, he'll give you power to witness of the resurrection. And then when the, the Spirit did come in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, we find Peter on the day of Pentecost, he preaches and he focuses on Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Jesus and the resurrection. Over and over again. This is the emphasis. I'm not saying there's no place for a good argument. I'm definitely not saying there is no place for apologetics. I, I, I love Francis Schaeffer uh, and his approach. Uh, absolutely. But we are saying that the focus nevertheless is always to get people whether it be to begin with a little discussion on creationism versus evolutionism, but it's to get people to the point that we can tell them God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the heart of the message. It's not, well, I didn't get the gospel, but I, I'm pretty sure they're not going to vote Democrat next time. I never got to what really I needed to get to, but I think now they, they're going to go and get rid of that blue hair and get their hair back to the normal color. So I've, at least I've got some victory. No, that's not the point. The point is to get to the opportunity to tell them about the person and work of Jesus. I hope you can see that. The manner of his approach wasn't heavy-handed, wasn't compromising, but it was clever, it was attractive. Well, and I know some say, well, it's not about being winsome. I think Paul, believe it or not, was winsome. He went in there to get people's eyes locked into his eyes and, and to build friendships. Hey, how you doing today? I saw you yesterday. It's so that when he says that, they don't run off and go, oh, here he comes again, let's get out of here. He, he wanted a relationship. He, he connected. And when he got the connection, he told them about Jesus and the resurrection. And then in Acts 17, verse 17, we find this. He was in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. He was dependent on God's providence. Not that he sat on a bench in an isolated spot and said, well, in God's providence, if somebody comes and sits beside me, I'll tell them about Jesus and the resurrection. No, he was in the marketplace. Hey, what's this thing you've got here? How much is this? Okay, I'll, I'll think about that. I'll come back later. Oh, yes, I am the guy that was talking to him yesterday. Did you overhear that conversation? He was in the marketplace. But he also had a real understanding. And, and the, 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 the scripture here points out there was a, a sense in which he was very open to God's providence. He was dependent on God sending people. People who happened to be there. When opportunities came, he took them. There would have been an alertness. There would have been a, just a consistency of an interest in being a witness for Jesus Christ. I fear that sometimes we excuse ourselves for not taking opportunities God gives us. And we'll say things like, well, I didn't want to push it down the guy's throat, which is fair enough. But there's a difference between failing to take an opportunity that happens to be there and being pushy and irritable and, uh, or, or irritating and just silly. Uh, when I say that silly, what I mean is, for example, I knew a guy in Liverpool in England, and he would always get a younger Christian in his church, you know, a wee gullible one, to go and stand at the front of a line anywhere, like Subway, although there's no Subway in England, but anyway, a, a store, like, you know, a fast food. You go and stand at the front, get to the front. He would come in at the back and he'd say, is there anybody in this line that knows Jesus Christ as their own and personal saviour? And the wee guy at the front is supposed to go, yes, I do. I'm trusting in Jesus. You know, and people in the middle are like watching a tennis match. Like, you know, and, and, and it was just silly. That wasn't happened to be there. That was being, in my opinion, you may differ and that's fine, pushy and annoying. But the truth of the matter is, Paul, in a, in a very real world situation, was in the marketplace and when a wee opportunity came with someone who happened to be there, he was ready. There was an alertness. There was an awareness. And he took the opportunities. So that's a little bit about Paul going in. Now, we hear that. And I've not described it a tenth or anything like as good as it should be described. So when he went in there, everybody got saved. Everybody in the marketplace got on their knees and repented and trusted in Christ. No, that's not how it worked. Look at verse 18, the responses to this. You think, oh, Paul knew how to do it. 
Oh, if I could just have Paul's personality, Paul's content, Paul's tact, I would be the man, I would be the evangelist. Well, look at verse 18. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? What, who are you talking about? The Apostle Paul. He's never babbled in his life. But they thought he did. What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. Well, they were right and they were wrong. It wasn't gods, but it was a god they didn't know. But they see that as just despicable and dismissive. He preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul drew attention from the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And look, in this case here, he chooses a verb, sambalo in the Greek, and it, it describes how they met him. They encountered him. They encountered him. What does the ESV say there? I should have looked at that. What does it say? Verse 18. They conversed. Right. That's good. I'm glad I asked that. Because that, I knew there was something in my head about that. That is a weaker translation than is deserved here. They encountered this word, sambalo. It, it, it doesn't always have the vicious or violent element attached to it, but it does show more of a cross-examination, more of an argumentativeness. So it's not dialogomai. It's stronger than that. And my maybe I'm wrong saying it's not a great translation, but I think encounter gives the meaning a little bit clearer. It was more of a kind of, you know, a, a, a roadblock. They, they, they kind of tried to stop him in his tracks. They got into it with the Apostle Paul. Not physically, so we're not talking violence. It was discussion, it was conversation, but it was of the ilk that was beyond dialogue. Just a good discussion. It was more a cross-examination type of discussion. A, a more lively debate than maybe Paul had already been willingly engaged in. Airing their skepticism, airing their objections. It was a, a lively debate, at least. The Epicureans and the Stoics, of course, were by no means of one mind. Between themselves, there was a lot of disagreement and division. The Epicureans were, according to Keener, a philosophical school that valued pleasure, the absence of pain and disturbance, and disbelieved in the gods of ancient myths. He goes on to say, they were influential only in the educated upper classes and their views about God and gods were similar to deism. Namely, he was, if there is a God, he's uninvolved, he's distant from the universe, sort of irrelevant. Keener actually says, if the Epicureans could have a theme song, it would have been, keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side, keep on the sunny side of life. They were kind of optimists, and just looking for pleasure, not gross sin pleasure necessarily, but just let's have a pleasant life. Let's be pleasant. Just be happy. Just be happy. The Stoics, on the other hand, they believed in, the, in a supreme God. However, they believed that this God was manifested through numerous lesser deities. Hence, they could embrace the pantheism of Athens, no problem but they had a more pessimistic view on life. They saw sorrow as inevitable. They saw themselves as victims of fate. One just had to get on with it. Just keep a stiff upper lip, accept your lot, there's nothing you can do about it, and plod on. If they had a theme song, it would have been, I'm a man of constant sorrow. I've been troubled all my days. I bid farewell to old Kentucky, the place where I was born and raised. For six long years I've been in trouble. No pleasure here on earth I've found. I love that song, by the way. 
sung so well in that movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It's really good. But they were just kind of a wee bit miserable. So you've got, on the one hand, the Epicureans, on the other hand, the Stoics. They don't get on with each other, but isn't it interesting when the gospel comes to town? It's like, hey, come on, we're partners. We're partners. It's happened every generation. And we, we look at the world around us in this post-Christian world and we think, how come Islam is backed in America by the LGBTQ guys and, and there's all this buddy uh, buddiness, and we don't understand it? It's just, it's here, it's not new. Enemies become friends when they are encountering the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that they scoffed. These various philosophers united together and said, what does this babbler want to say? Their initial impression of Paul was he was a babbler. According to Ramsey, this was Athenian slang. And it literally meant a seed picker, and it was used to refer to the chirping little cock sparrows that would descend on seeds that would be scattered in the streets of Athens at times. And the idea is that these teachers are saying he's like a little cock sparrow that's come in and he's, 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 a, he's just picking at things and he's, he's petty and he's irrelevant. Scoffing. A babbler, they're saying. But there were others who were not scoffers. They were curious. They say he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They were at least interested to listen. They weren't mocking. They were just giving an assessment. This isn't their effort to deride necessarily. It's just, okay, well, what do you mean babbler? I think he's telling us about some gods uh, somewhere. From the days of Chrysostom, interpreters have suggested that Luke is conveying to us the fact that some Athenians thought Paul was proclaiming two different gods. Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and Anastasius. To their pagan, uneducated ears, it might have sounded as if that's what Paul was saying. So this is maybe a genuine effort to try and say, I've been listening to him. He's talking about Jesus and Anastasius, the Greek word for resurrection. And they're thinking, yeah, that's the, the, the goddess. It sounds to me like that's what he's talking about. So they're listening, but they're not understanding. They're smart, but they don't get it. And we've always found that, isn't it? Doesn't matter how smart a man is. Doesn't matter how hard he listens. Really, it's only when the Lord opens his eyes and opens his ears, he understands. That's the point. So they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is. You're bringing strange things to our ears. We want to know what they mean. And that's where we'll leave off just now as far as the narrative is, is concerned. We'll pick it up later. But just finally to underline this, opportunities are out there even in a post-Christian world. People are still needy. They don't know how needy they are, but they're, they're needy. And prayerfully and strategically, like Paul, we need to be those that are going into the marketplace. That's wherever the Lord has placed us, meeting whoever happens to be there. When they come to Christ, it will be because we've told them about Christ. Not because we've beaten them in arguments about politics, morality, the future, America. It's because we've told them about Jesus. But also, we need to make sure that we, we recognize that we don't need to be articulate in every argument. We just need to know the Lord ourselves so we can tell people about him.
And how many have said, well, I would like to speak more. There's a guy beside me in work. There's this situation I'd like to, but I don't know this and I don't know that and I don't know the other thing. Do you know about Jesus and the resurrection? Start there. And he might give you a real good beating on some other issue that comes up. And you think, oh, I failed. Because he, he, he raised evolution and I couldn't answer him. But did you tell him about Jesus and the resurrection? That's the point. Well, I hope that for just now, we've made our point. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts.